It takes everybody doing their little part to make one big success. Hello and welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 290. Today, I'm joined by Sensei Bob Sharoni. If you're new to the show, if you don't know my voice, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. We make sparring gear and apparel and training accessories, and we also produce Martial Arts Radio the show that gives me the amazing opportunity to speak with some of the world's best martial artists, and you get the opportunity to listen. If you want to check out the show notes, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and all of our products and links to all of our other projects are at whistlekick.com. Today's guest comes to us via kind of this multi-part introduction that we'll get into in the episode. So I don't want to ruin it here. But it wasn't the typical way that we get guests. And on today's show, we talk about Sensei's amazing instructor. We talk about a mutual friend. We talk about humility and ego and his views on those subjects, as well as so much more. Had a great time talking to him, and I'm sure you're going to have a great time listening. So here we go. Hey, Sensei, how are you? Good. How you doing, Jeremy? I'm doing great. It's good that we're we're finally getting to do this. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Well, cool. So, I got your I got the spelling of your name, Sharoni, right? That's perfect. Awesome. That's perfect. Awesome. I always try to ask. Yeah, you know, you know I've, I do a lot of announcing and whatnot, and uh, you know, at the tournaments, and there's. Jeez, I'll probably get about 20% of them right, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it's amazing how much we, I mean, I, not so much me, because, you know, Lesniak, that's not exactly a name that rolls off the tongue or that people have heard. And in fact, if you try to type it into any smartphone now, it's it tries to autocorrect as lesbian. Oh, jeez. But, <laughs> but there are a lot of people out there who really identify with their name and the spelling and the pronunciation of their name. So I work really hard to make sure that we get it right. Sure, sure, I understand. Cool. So what's going on out your way? Oh, just a typical Tuesday, getting started with my usual schedule and be off to work for a little bit later on and then off to teach at my class tonight. And so nothing too different than the than the norm. Cool. Yeah. Well, well it, of course, besides this interview. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and and the, the audio is sounding good, and, and if it's okay with you, you know, let's just kind of keep rolling in, instead of having the, the formal intro that we we often, or I guess we should say used to do, because we've been doing more of these lately, where we just kind of start from the beginning, give the, the listeners the, the entirety of our conversation, really. Sure. Okay. Okay. I mean, if you have any, any questions or deep, dark secrets you want to talk about before we start the, <laughs> the official interview, maybe we, we should do that off the record, but... If not, then then let's just kind of roll. Sounds good. Okay. Well, listeners, I'm I'm here talking with Sensei Bob Sharoni, who, you know, a lot of the guests that end up on the show, it's, you know, there isn't much of a story there. It's, I reached out to somebody, or they reached out to us, or somebody that's been on the show or listens to the show made a suggestion. I mean, that covers ninety five percent. But in that last 5%, we end up with some folks who have a bit more of an interesting story, and you're in that 5%. So I would love to for you to tell the listeners, because I, I think this kind of will, will give us a – once we're done with that, we can, we can kind of steer off a little bit and talk about your background. But I think it's a good introduction to what's going on, to why we're talking today, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, well, uh, the the way that the connection was made was uh, I made friends uh, through social media with uh, Sensei Scott Lombardo, who apparently um, is a friend of yours. Because and of the show. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Because of the show. <laughs> I didn't know him before we interviewed, honestly. Oh, okay. There, there was a news article that popped up here. We'll take a tangent off the tangent. There was a news article that popped up about a, 
a man in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is just a couple hours from me, who was doing some really cool stuff working with veterans with martial arts as a nonprofit. And I said, this guy's got to come on the show. And so we just kind of hit it off and we've become friends and I've trained with him and, and he's come to some of our events and he's just, he's a great guy. So, so you, you met him via social media. Yeah, that's right. I had seen a picture um, with him and my sensei Fumio Demura in the airport. They were both waiting for their flights and uh, they got to talking and whatnot. And um, I made a comment uh, on the picture to the effect of, hey, that's my sensei. And um, from there on, Scott and I just started um, you know, communicating back and forth. And it was amazing how many things we had in common. And how many coincidences or, you know, likenesses that, uh, you know, came about. It was just too amazing. And so we continue to communicate. And, uh, you know, even though we haven't had a chance to meet in person yet, um, I can say from my end that I feel like we've known each other for an eternity. So uh, it's amazing how uh, friendships and relationships develop through martial art connections like this. They do. They do. And, you know, I'm going to add a little bit more into that because there was a piece there that that you may not have been aware of. So I was it? Let's see, episode 130. So we're we're this is going to be 290 something. So a little while ago, I had the opportunity to talk to Demara Sensei on the show, and just you know, one of my my I get I don't know what I want to say crowning achievements, but there there's just. When I think about it, you know, there's still some emotion that comes up for me. The ability to talk to him just was was so huge. You, you, you I'm sure, understand that, being able to train with him, how important, how much he means to so many people. Yeah, that's right. You know, as a matter of fact, I, um, I listened to that episode. And, uh, you know, since they had uh, told us <clears throat> about it and, you know, steered us in the direction to to go ahead and listen to it and um yeah i can imagine the uh the feeling you might have had interviewing somebody like him because he's done so much over his career in martial arts and has made so many friends and so many contacts and even though i've been a student of his for almost three decades i still feel very privileged to um, see him, train with him, talk to him, and just be part of his organization. So here we are. I get this this email, or maybe it was a Facebook message, from Master Lombardo, and it's a picture of him and Sensei at an airport. And he says, look who I ran into. <laughs> and so he reached out and he said, you know, can you get this photo to him? You know, he knew that I had communication with him because of him having been on the episode. So I pass that on and, and, you know, it was just, it was really fun for me to see another person that I knew, a friend of mine who felt so similarly, similarly, there we go. There's a word about <laughs> his meeting with Demera sensei. And he just means so much to so many people, you know, and, and I, I look at it, um, you know, we'll, we'll stop talking about him and start talking about you in just a moment. But I think that a lot of what we're going to hear from you, I'm completely speculating, will have some context for folks because, you know, we are who we are because of where we've come from, because of who has trained us, who we have worked with, that that way we are raised, you know, it takes a village, however you want to look at it for us as martial arts students. To know where we come from is really important. And for me, as someone who was part of that karate kid wave, you know, there there's nobody I look up to more than him. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're not the first person I've heard say something similar to that before. <laughs> He's um <clears throat> Whether it's through his books or videos or uh, seminars, uh, appearances, movies, whatever it is, there's so many different ways that people have got to be exposed to uh, Sensei Demura and his teachings and philosophies. And, um, you know, when I was just a young student uh, training in his dojo, I would notice that 
when other senseis would come to visit our dojo, they would all call him sensei. And I sat and reflected on that, and I realized that I was with a good sensei and in a good place, and this is where I was going to uh, spend my time training in karate. Hmm. And how did that time in, in karate start? Did you start with him or elsewhere? What you know? Give us some of the background. <clears throat> well, uh, I actually started um, when I was about 19 years old. I was uh, going to college at Saddleback College. And I needed a PE credit, so I took a karate self-defense class taught by Dan McGough. And um, I signed up for the class, and I did the semester. And at the end of the semester, there was an opportunity to test for rank. So I went ahead and signed up for that. And uh, Sensei Demura had come down to give the test. And in those days, he visited all of his dojos and did all the testing. And then after the test, he would give, you know, a 15-minute or 30-minute, whatever time was allowed, kind of uh, class and some training. And I was so impressed with him that, you know, I went home that night and thought to myself, I want to be like that man. You know, just the, his movements and his character and his charismatic way about him uh, impressed me so much that, you know, it really, really uh, motivated me to continue uh, my karate training. So I was, I was training at Saddleback for probably about a year. I had taken another semester and started to meet other instructors within the organization, like uh, Bruce Butler, Greg Collier were two of the people that I met through that, uh, that class at Saddleback. And so I also began to train with them as they had dojos that were close by my area where I lived in Mission Viejo at that time. And ultimately, when I got up to about a green belt level, uh, the outside dojos typically, you know, send the students to our Hombu Dojo in Santa Ana to uh, test uh, directly in front of Sensei Demuro in his dojo. And they have what we call a recheck, where you have to go back to the uh, sparring class and uh, they'll, you know, check up on your test and see if you've made any improvement and whatnot. And at that time, that's when I started training full time down at the uh, Hombo Dojo with Fumio Demura. Mm. Wow. Now, you talked about his charisma. One of the things that seems to be, I don't, I don't want to say universal, but quite common among people when they start martial arts, especially when they start older than, you know, young children is that they find something that they were missing. Sometimes people know they were missing it. Sometimes it's something only in retrospect. What was it that you found in that self-defense class that kept you coming back? Um, what kept me coming back was um, the benefit that I started to feel from my karate training. I started to feel that uh, I had a little more confidence, and uh, I was somewhat of a shy person back at that time, uh, still you know, growing up and figuring out who I was and whatnot. And uh, so noticing the benefits of the uh, self-confidence, and then I started getting into better shape and making friends, and ultimately ended up in a place that had a family-like feel and atmosphere. And um, I just got hooked on it and had to have more and more and more. And uh, I'm glad that I chose to do that because now I can say that where I'm at in life and a lot of my successes stem from that early training in, in the dojo when I was younger. Okay. And what, what do you think life might have looked like without, you know, say you had taken up rack and ball or baseball instead of that self-defense class? Well, you know, I, I still could have ended up, you know, becoming successful in one way or another. Um, but I just don't think that I would have had the extent of, um, 
this family like feel. You know, I had played uh, several different sports when I was growing up and in high school I was on the swimming team and water polo and I was even on the golf team for one year. And, you know, there's a sense of camaraderie and whatnot in team sports, but in martial arts training, uh, it's a completely different different feel. And like I say, the best way I could describe it is like a family-like atmosphere and uh, people support each other. And um, where it differs from a team sport is, as you know, in martial arts, um, you know, it's, you become dependent on yourself and you have to self-motivate and you have to um, check yourself and you know, continue to improve yourself. So I think that that's probably the the largest benefit that I got from that as opposed to some other team sport was being able to depend on myself and and trust my training and go into different things in life knowing that if I could do karate and if I can get up in front of a tournament with hundreds of people and and do a kata or do a sparring match, that I could do just about anything else in life. So you have competed? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I competed a lot when I was younger. And is that something that you stopped doing consciously or it became a time issue or or or, or what? Well, in our organization, um, you, you know, competing is is part of what we do, uh, but it's not all of what we do. So as I was coming up through the color belts, working towards my black belt, uh, I did a lot of competing and, you know, won various trophies and medals and whatnot. Um, I never moved on to be like regional champion or national champion or have any kind of a title or whatnot. whatnot. But what, what I did learn from that was as a color belt, we, we learn how to do the kind of the smaller parts of running a tournament, like scorekeeping, staging, charting, um, judging, uh, different things like that. So going through uh, various uh, seminars that we would have prior to tournaments and whatnot, I learned how to do just about every aspect of running a karate tournament. So even though I never earned any titles or got to any level of fame from my competition, I did basically learn how to do every part that's involved in a karate tournament. And that includes um, announcing. As uh, several years ago, I started to uh, work together with our announcer for, for many, many years, Greg Collier, and he guided me through uh, the different steps and and you know ways to announce and speak in public and whatnot, and the amazing part of that is coming from a person who was very shy when I was younger and had a really hard time uh, speaking in public and giving speeches in school and whatnot. Now, because of that, I have this confidence that I can speak in front of any size crowd. Um, I can announce at demonstrations, tournaments. And so even though I don't have the uh, world champion trophy, I have this ability to be able to uh, go to a tournament and I can step in and help out at any stage in any aspect of running the tournament. And that's that's my my gold medal, so to speak. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've learned from hosting this show is that the ability to speak is a lot more than simply being confident. There, there's a lot of other stuff that goes into it. And I'm going to guess, and I'm curious, how has that skill set impacted your martial arts? The ability to present information live in front of people in a dynamic way when you're not reading from a script? Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, thinking about the different ways in in my life um, where I've used public speaking to my advantage. And, um, you know, there's just so many different ways uh, from meeting people and making friends, um, 
being able to teach, uh, being able to speak clearly and and uh, concisely uh, helps to communicate your points better. And uh, when I first started speaking, I I would make these notes and. Uh, Okay, this is what I'm going to say first. This is what I'm going to say next, and and you know it almost got to where I was like reading from a script. And one time we were, uh, I was going to speak for a demonstration, and I had the outline of what was going to happen, and so I you know wrote up my script, and then um, my sensei uh, Fumio Demura at the last minute threw out the script, changed everything, and I had to shoot from the hip, and. That's what I learned the value of being able to speak without notes and without too much preparation, uh, just to uh, be more natural, be who you are. And I think that that's the best way to communicate. Mm. You know, when I hear your description about that, you know, shooting from the hip and just kind of just kind of rolling with it, not having it be scripted or rehearsed. The first thing that was coming to mind was kata. And for, for our non-karate listeners, forms. Yeah. You know, the idea mm-hmm. that I, I see so many people, especially in competition, you can tell that they've practiced it hundreds or thousands of times. But every one of those times has been exactly the same, and it comes off robotic. And I don't Ye- want to listen to someone speak or sing that sounds robotic. Right, right. Right. I think that's the key to being um, a good martial artist and, um, you know, even, uh, you know, continuing into the aspects of our life is to to do what's natural, to be natural, have uh, natural movements, natural uh, expressions. And and um, in regards to speaking, having, you know, natural, natural words, natural phrases. Is that something that you teach your students? Oh yes, definitely. I think that's that's the key. Um, as you mentioned, you can you you watch people you know do their kata or their form, and it looks so robotic. Um, I think that when when you practice enough and you go out in front of a group and you trust your training and just be natural and do what you've learned how to do, that's the best way to communicate a you know or express a kata and same same idea transfers into speaking makes sense here on the show we like to talk about stories stories are one of my favorite things in the world so i'm wondering if you might share with us one or maybe a couple of your favorites from your time sure um the first story that comes to mind was uh I was, I think I was at a green belt level uh, and got asked to go and help out with a karate demonstration at the Hanamatsuri Festival in the Buddhist temple in Anaheim with uh, Sensei Demura. And it was about, uh, I think about a week before they assigned me to do, um, do a weapon. And the weapon was going to be the Sai. So I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and felt like I was really ready to, to, you know, show my kata and, you know, in, in front of this audience. Well, it was a few minutes before, um, we were behind the closed curtains doing some last minute preparations and sensei called all the Kobodo people that were going to demonstrate up together and he switched the weapons on us and he said okay bob now give me that he gave the side to somebody else and gave me the tonfa and said you're going to do tonfa and i had never done any kind of tonfa training before um i definitely didn't know a kata so you know talk about being put under pressure <laughs> So what I ended up doing was I ended up, you know, when my turn was called, I got up on the stage and I just did a pinon kata, which are, you know, in in our style are very, you know, basic beginner level katas. And I did the kata pinon nidon with the tonfa and actually pulled it off, believe it or not. (laughs) I'm actually, I'm I'm doing it right now. I'm imagining 
tone from my hand, and that actually plays out pretty well. It 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 works out not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one thing that I learned about uh, about Sensei Fumio Demura is do not get comfortable around him. He he with his students he you know i think when he sees us getting comfortable he likes to tweak things a little bit to keep us on our toes and uh back then uh, on that day when it happened i didn't appreciate that concept but now that i'm much older and i look back on it um i i definitely have an appreciation for for the way that he changes things up on us and and keeps us on our toes so, so um that was intentional then that wasn't just him thinking that things would go better for some other other reason this was forget the demonstration forget the audience this is a teaching opportunity yes yes i believe that that is the idea and you know having having trained with sensei for so long i've gotten to know um you know better how he is and and how he runs things and uh you know you just always have to be ready for anything and I think that's that's a key component in in being able to, you know, defend yourself uh, in any kind of a situation where you may be attacked or um, or whatnot is to be able to adapt and be able to be ready for any kind of change and then adapt to that change. So uh, what what Sensei has always taught us is, you know, if you put water in a square glass, then the water becomes square. And put the water in a round glass, then water becomes round and always level. So even though at the moment you don't really appreciate being put on the spot and having all the nerves and, and whatnot, but I think in the long run, the, the benefit is tenfold on uh, being put under pressure a little bit, let's say, or um, having to adapt to different situations. So, you know, as a, uh, uh, at my stage in life, I really appreciate the different times that, you know, he's done that. And that's not the only time there's, you could talk to just about any of our students and they'll have similar stories like that about him. <laughs> and how do you carry that lesson through to your students? We have a lot of you know, school owners and instructors that listen to the show. So I, I always try and pull out those bits. You know, I, I, I use that idea, um, <clears throat> with my students, just as Sensei always has done with us, um, I may have them turn around and face a different direction and do a kata in a way that they're not used to, um, you know, seeing different, let's call them landmarks or whatever, to, you know, what's front and what's back. Uh, sometimes we may practice a kata um, reverse instead of, you know, starting to the left, we would start to the right and uh, get them to be to be ready for just about anything and be able to act naturally rather than always assuming that everything in life is pre-programmed because, you know, as we know, that's, that's not the case. And it sounded like you might have a second one that you wanted to share as you started this first one or, or did I miss here? Uh, let me think. I can, I'm sure I could think of something. Well, I, uh, I didn't want to risk cutting you off as we, we wandered around if there was if there was more good stuff i mean it's all good stuff but i'm sure we'll <laughs> what, what, rather rather than put you on the spot and have you think of a second one let's just kind of keep rolling sure when did you know you wanted to teach uh, well you know in 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 our dojo um you know we we start becoming teachers very early on and how that, how that works out is, um, you know, in a class situation, uh, you know, you may be a slightly higher rank than somebody. And so you'll get paired up with a partner and, and, uh, you know, teach a kata to somebody, uh, not that you're necessarily running a class or, you, you know, you, you have a school or something like that, but we all know how to teach because sensei has uh, brought us up that way to, uh, give back. So he always tells us never forget where you come from. And in uh, Japanese martial arts, we refer to that as shoshin, or a beginner's spirit, or beginner's mind. So we learn to remember where we came from, and that 
we were once a lower belt or a beginner student at one time, and there was always people that helped us. So the idea is to not just uh, take what you learn and go, but give back, give back to the other students and give back to the younger generations. And this way we learn how to work together as human beings and we develop uh, friendships and bonds and we're able to get along much better this way. So um, early on, I, I knew that I wanted, I wanted to teach and, you know, and I've trained in several different dojos within our same style with different instructors. And so each one of them had an impact on my wanting to teach because I wanted to essentially be like them. What was it about them that you wanted to model? Well, just as, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, um, you know, in, in a dojo, there tends to be kind of like a family-like atmosphere. So, you know, my early instructors were either some type of like father figure or um, older brother kind of figure to me. So just much as, as as you would look up to, you know, a famous athlete or, you know, even like your father or your older brother, that's what happened to me in my karate training is is – you know, looking up to them and, and, and each instructor had a little different thing that I, that I picked up on. Um, you know, one was, you know, very professional in the way that he did things. Uh, one was more relaxed and added a aspect of humor into his teaching. And uh, one was very strict and made us hold positions for a long time. And so, you know, we, we are where we come from. So, Everything that we've learned in our early stages, you know, typically tends to come out in the later years of our training. And uh, so I could say that I am who I am today because of those role models and because of their examples. And ultimately, it has led me to um, to teach karate. And I enjoy every minute of it. When we talk about that notion of shoshin, beginner's mind the need to remember that we are perpetual students, that we are not the first in any way to do what we're doing. That kind of dovetails into a subject that's come up on the show. And I'm curious of your perspective, because in in the way that you're talking, it's your, everything seems to come from a place of, of service. You know, when, when I'm hearing you talk and, and it just, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know, I don't, I don't know you beyond, you know, the, the emails and the Facebook messages we've exchanged and the 30 or so minutes we've been talking today. But I, I just, I get that impression that, you know, when you step out on, on the mats or on the floor or whatever you have in your dojo, that you're there to serve your students. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, you could say that. Um, you know, there's a, there's a feeling of obligation, um, you know, to to give back okay. what you've taken out of martial arts training. And so I definitely feel, feel that way. And, um, you know, even though, you know, somebody like, uh, my sensei Fumi Odemura is been successful in so many aspects of his life. Um, he's had a lot of support from his students and, you know, I'm sure that he would agree that, uh, you know, it, it takes everybody doing their little part to make one big success. And so I try to instill that same concept, uh, into my students that, you know, we have to learn to work together and, you know, be good at what you do and then use that to help build the organization and to build the group. So, for example, in our dojo, you know, we have uh, somebody who's an accountant. We have, uh, you know, somebody who's a woodworker. We have uh, somebody who's good at sewing. We have somebody that does screen printing. So putting all those skills together, we're able to build a strong organization. And each person contributes uh, what their specialty is. And I think that's a big success to uh, creating a strong organization is being able to use all of your people 
uh, to become one big success. Sure. And I want to keep going with that just a little bit more. One of the things that I find myself talking about, one of the things that I get a tremendous amount of email about, and I feel like you're in a pretty good position to talk about this, is ego and the ties between ego and rank and title. And here, your instructor, the man that I, I have referred to as the most influential living martial artist. I don't know if you would agree with that assessment. He takes the title of sensei. Uh -huh. If there is anyone who would warrant a grander title in the world of martial arts today, I would say it's him. Where does that come from, and how does that tie in, if you see that it does, with Shoshin, and perhaps maybe this is a, a question about culture within or, your organization? And th this is just something that's personally very important to me. So listeners, if, if you don't like this part, maybe skip forward, but it, it just... I'm, tr I'm slowly trying to wrap my brain around this whole ba bailiwick of, of stuff. This, this ego rank title thing that keeps coming up on the show that I keep hearing about, that I keep bumping into people who, you know, I can tell they're quote unquote doing it right and quote unquote doing it wrong, but I don't know that I yet have the words or the tools to talk about it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, that's definitely, uh, something that you always will hear people when they speak about, uh, Sensei Demura is his humbleness. <clears throat> and, um, you know, a good example is, you know, uh, somebody was in the dojo and <clears throat> uh, visiting the dojo and they asked him, they said, well, you know, why do they call you Sensei? He said, and his answer was, well, I guess that's my nickname. <laughs> Rather than saying, well, it's because I've done this and I have this rank and, you know, on and on, as we see a lot of times in martial arts, his answer was as simple as, that's my nickname. And he always demonstrates this, this sign of humbleness. And I think that's a key, key point to becoming successful in the martial arts is to remain humble. Um, one of the uh, greatest uh, signs I've ever seen in front of a dojo, uh, the first time I seen it was uh, in front of a dojo in Ireland that's uh, called the Blue Water Dojo. And as you walk in, there was a little chalkboard and had a message on, and it said, students, please remove your shoes and your ego before entering the dojo. And... As a matter of fact, that was another coincidence that uh, Sensei Scott Lombardo and I had shared in yeah, I, that he also has that same sign right. in front of his dojo. Yeah, you had just posted that on Facebook recently, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I thought I'd, I did. That's I the picture. I'd seen that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think, you know, by remaining humble, um, you open up the doors to learn a lot more and to absorb a lot more from the martial arts. Um, you know, ego can really get in the way of somebody's training and, and hinder their progress. Um, when, when I was, uh, a brown belt first cue, which is the, you know, last step before you test for black belt, I was really excited about, uh, about testing and, um, you know, I was talking to one of my instructors at that time, Bruce Butler, and he told me, he said, well, there's no rush to become a black belt. He said, it's better to be a brown belt that looks and moves like a black belt than the other way around. And his words have kind of been uh, a guiding principle for me to try to keep myself as humble as I can and not put too much emphasis on rank or, um, you know, what level uh, uh, black belt that I might have or whatnot. Um, at, on the same note, I always try to, you know, respect my seniors, you know, which in karate we refer to as senpai. Um, and 
but I try not to put too much important on numbers and, and ranks and titles and whatnot because I think a lot of times they just interfere with uh, progress in martial arts training. Is that humility something that is intentional in your organization's culture or is that something that just kind of happens more subliminally. You know, I I think that in in the in our culture <clears throat> there's uh you know somewhat of a pressure, you know, to succeed. You know, we go to school and you know, you want to get an A and you know, you you want to get accepted to a good school and get a good job and make good money and and there's this pressure to become this great person. And uh, in a karate dojo, I think that martial arts tends to attract big egos sometimes. So for a lot of people, it's not something that's natural, even though I could say that I feel I've met people that that may have been like naturally humble people, but I think for most of us, it's it's a skill that we have to practice and learn, uh, just like anything else that we do. You know, you have to do continuous training to become good at it, and then become that kind of person. So I I think that being humble uh, takes a little effort and takes practice to to truly you know be that kind of a person. It's hard. And it seems like it gets harder as we get better as martial artists. And that seems to be the 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 piece that I'm I'm observing, you know, watching because I, I like I said, I we talk about this on the show and I've had this conversation. I've been exposed to so many amazing people. And the common thread among the majority of the folks who have been on this show, and I'm no listeners don't write in, I'm not naming names. <laughs> I won't do it. <laughs> Almost everybody that's been on the show has been really humble. And there seems to be this inverse correlation. The more people have achieved, the less they care about their title and their rank. It's almost like. Actually, no, I'm not going to say it because it, I, I, this is your time and your space, and I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, is in regards to anything, any any reaction? It, it you you started to talk, and and I was finishing up and started to continue, and decided not to. Yeah, I think um, you know, as you were saying, you know, the the more skill that we attain and uh, the more experience that that we get, uh, it's really easy to, you know, let the ego build up, you know, behind it. But um, I, you know, we, we come back to that, to that shoshin, to that beginner's spirit and, and remembering that at one time, we didn't have those skills and we didn't have those abilities. And, um, you know, I think that's a key part in, in, working to to become a humble person who's been the most influential person in your martial arts and if it's the the name that i'm going to assume we're going to hear then then maybe you'll give us more than one um you know hands down uh my sensei fumi odemra has been my biggest um influence um, and, you know, for obvious reasons. But um, outside of him, I would have to say that um, all of my dojo mates from my early years of training have been my greatest influence. And the reason why I say that is <clears throat> because I remember being a younger student in karate and, you know, there was all these black belts you know, around me and they were so good and, and, and good fighters and, and good performers of kata that it was almost seemed kind of out of reach. But 
having good dojo mates like I had in my early years, I was a little more able to connect with them. And uh, some of my friends like uh, Damon Pace and uh, Nin Ho and uh, Tan Nguyen, Christy Hines, we were all about the same about the same level coming up, you know, within a few years of each other. And there was always like a friendly competition between us. You know, when we lined up to do basics, you know, we were always trying to be one, one step a little faster than the other and uh, try to be just a little bit better than each other and challenge each other. And I think that was a key to, to growing up in those early years and, and, and uh, having that kind of motivation. And I don't remember there being a lot of, uh, you know, let's say ego in between us. You know, we were always uh, kind of like a family support, you know, and, and I keep on coming back to that idea of family in the dojo because it, it really does give that kind of feeling. And uh, being a member of an organization, I think that's important to, to have that kind of a feel and, and comfort and whatnot. So even though I had my senior students, uh, you know, our senior black belts around as examples, you know, as a beginner, it just seemed like they were, they were so far out of touch. And with your own dojo mates who are around your same level and, and you can relate to each other and support each other and, and create this atmosphere of a friendly competition with each other. And that seemed to be a key to, to good development and, you know, working towards, you know, those higher levels in karate. And if you had the opportunity to train with anyone that you haven't anywhere in time, anywhere in the world, who would you want to train with? The person that I would want to train with is Sensei Scott Lombardo. <laughs> <laughs> and Something tells me that's going to happen. It, it's my, going to happen. My gut it's says going it'll to happen, happen soon. He's, it, he's uh, planned a, um, a visit uh, in sometime in July. He's going to come out to California and uh, spend some time out here, and we're going to get together and train together, and uh, he's going to you know visit – uh, my dojo and train with my students. And, um, you know, it's just so amazing, you know, as I had told our story about how we met just, you know, through that one picture in the airport with Sensei Demura, you know, we just have had so many coincidences and likenesses that, that it's just, uh, there's too many to name. And, um, you know, one thing that I've learned to appreciate about him is, his uh, dedication to the uh, working with the veterans at in in VMAT, the Veterans Martial Arts Training, and uh, the things that he does um, by giving those veterans a place to go uh, to share in camaraderie and you know use martial arts to to help them, and uh, that's been something that uh, I'm very impressed with him. And, uh, you know, I hope someday to be able to, to help out, uh, the same way that he does, you know, with his, his, uh, volunteer work and dedication that he gives to, uh, to the veterans. He's a good um, man and, and certainly a, a wonderfully skilled martial artist. I, I'm jealous that he'll be headed out your way, but maybe if you reciprocate at some point, I can come down and crash the party. <laughs> that would be uh, one heck of a party. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what one of the goals is that Whistlekick continues to grow and get get really big so I have this, you know, bizarre disposable income and then I, you know, I'll I'll fly everybody that's been on the show, you know, who wants to come, you know, we'll have some big crazy training thing. Awesome. That yeah. would be amazing. Yeah, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? That's just, oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that's the stuff that I want to do, you know. People write and they're like, "Can you make this product?" Yeah, sure, but that's not really what I want to do. I just want to, I just want to train. I just want to hang out with my new <laughs> friends and train. Uh, yeah, that would that would be that would be something. Are you at all a fan of martial arts movies? Is is that a requirement? Are there are there titles that you have to say that you love because of uh, who you train with? 
<laughs> well, of course, um, you know, as you know, uh, you know, Sensei Dimmer has been involved in many, many movies over the years. Um, you know, of course, his, <clears throat> his most famous, uh, you know, role was uh, being the stunt double for Pat Morita in the in the Karate Kid movies. But, you know, he's done so many other movies, um, a few that I could think of. Uh, I know he's been in The Warrior Within, uh, Island of Dr. Moreau, uh, Bring Him Back Alive, Rising Sun, uh, Ninja, Mortal Kombat, Showdown in Little Tokyo. And I think that's probably about a quarter of the movies that he's been in. But um, I'd have to say that my all-time favorite movie is got to be Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. I mean, I remember being a little kid and just staring into the TV screen watching that movie and just wanting to be able to do all those things that Bruce Lee was doing, you know, in, in that in that movie. And forgive me, because I'm intentionally not doing math. I, I try not to figure out people's ages unless they want to talk about it. Where, where did your for the first time you saw that movie, Enter the Dragon, fit in with your martial arts career? Was that before? Or? Oh, long before. Okay. I was, yeah, I was like like still in, in, I think, probably elementary school during that time. So I was still a really young kid. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when I when I was growing up, I always, I always was was interested in karate and I remember uh, a flyer coming in the mail or some advertisement, you know, for a local karate class. And, you know, I asked my, my parents, I said, you know, Oh, I, I want to do karate, you know, and can you sign me up? And, and, uh, at that time, <clears throat> um, you know, my parents felt that, Oh, well, you know, karate is just fighting and, you know, you don't need that. You'll end up getting in trouble in school and, you know, without having any knowledge of the different kind of benefits of martial arts training, uh, you know, that was just the way that they felt at that time. So, you know, it resulted that I, I did a lot of different sports, you know, like baseball and soccer and and uh, football and swimming and things like that, which I really enjoyed. But I always wanted, I always wanted to do karate. And when I just, when I started college at Saddleback College and I needed a physical education requirement. You know, I saw that self-defense karate class and I said, this is for me. And that's where it all began was, was when I started college right after high school. I have this theory that we're all predestined into martial arts and it just takes a certain time. Actually, I don't know that I believe that. It just sounded like a good thing to say at the moment. <laughs> How about books? You know, certainly Sensei has written a number of books. People have a pretty polarized view on martial arts books, especially when it comes to learning how to do things from books. What's your view? Do you subscribe, in a sense, that martial arts books are worth reading? Or do you prefer to get out there and learn hands-on? Um, well, without a doubt, uh, there's there's no better way to to learn a martial art than than with a qualified sensei in a in a reputable dojo. Um, you know, I, I have dabbled around with books, and um, I do enjoy a lot of the older uh, books from the early 1900s, uh, like the ones written by uh, Kenwa Mabuni and. Uh, Funakoshi and some of those, uh, even though I don't understand the kanji and the writing, um, I do appreciate the old photos. And uh, me being not much of a reader, um, you know, picture books are great for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, my first karate instructor, Dan McGough, uh, told, I remember him teaching the class when I was uh, just a beginner. And he said, if you want to learn how to defend yourself, you need to get out here on the mat and you need to do self-defense. He said, when you were walking out in the dark parking lot in the middle of the night and this stranger comes up to you and, and, and tries to assault you, 
He said, you're not going to remember what's on page 34 of How to Karate. And you're not going to remember what's on, you know, the Time Mark 3.47 on the self-defense video. He said, you're going to remember what you do inside the dojo. And so that's why personally, I haven't put a large emphasis on on books. Um, I, I collect them. Um, but they pretty much sit on my shelf most of the time. And when I do flip through them, it's mostly picture reading, but, uh, I definitely subscri- subscribe to the, to that philosophy of gaining your experience in the dojo, um, making your mistakes in the dojo. That way, when you go out on the street, you'll be more prepared to handle any situation that might come in front of you. Yeah. Well said. Let's talk about goals. If you're training hard, if you're still actively teaching, certainly there's a reason. And for most folks, it seems that there are things that they haven't done yet, things that they're looking to accomplish. So what's on your list? My future goals uh, in karate is uh, I would like to continue to build up you know, my classes that I have now and build up my students. But ultimately, I would like to someday build my own freestanding dojo. And um, my business is, uh, I'm a general contractor. So I'm, you know, I'm a builder. And I've always wanted to be able to combine my karate and my building experience to build what for me would be the perfect freestanding dojo and then, you know, teach in that dojo and, uh, um, you know, use everything that I've learned over my years to create that and make that happen. Nice. Now, folks are listening. If they want to get a hold of you, maybe they're headed out your way and they want to see if they can drop in for a class or anything like that. How would people reach you? Okay, I'm currently teaching uh, at the Montanoso Recreation Center in the city of Mission Viejo. And uh, we have classes several times a week there. And um, I'm also currently still training with Sensei Demera at his Hombu Dojo in Santa Ana. And I help uh, teach the kata classes on Sunday morning with Dave and Christy Hines. Um, I have a Facebook page for my dojo at the Recreation Center. That's Gembu Kai Karate Do Montanoso. And uh, there's contact information and everything um, on that site. And uh, another source of contact would be um, my sensei's uh, website, gembukai-hq.org. That's the main website for uh, Japan Karate Do Genbukai, which is Sensei Fumio Demura's organization that that I teach under. Great. And of course, listeners will have the links to that in the show notes over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, as we always do. I really appreciate you being on the show today, Sensei. This has been a lot of fun. Great finally connecting with you. And what final words would you give the folks listening? Practice, practice, practice. Um, you know, there really isn't any shortcuts to, to becoming good at uh, martial arts or anything else in life for that matter. So, um, you know, we have a old, old saying in, in Japanese Budo, <clears throat> that's Hyaku Ren Jitoku. Uh, that means you practice a hundred times before you understand. And, um, that's something that I learned from my sensei Fumi Odemura. Um, I asked him one time about uh, some movements in a kata, and he said, oh, you don't understand that kata? And I said, no, sensei, I don't understand. And he said, you practice all the time? And I said, yeah, I practice all the time. He said, go practice for 100 more years, and then come back and ask me if you still don't understand. And that's what I think is the key to to becoming successful in martial arts in, in life, is to continuously practice, continuously research, and use your training to, to gain your knowledge and experience and then pass it on into any other aspect of your life. 
when we think about legacy in the martial arts, it's important to think about who is going to carry on the legacy of the people who are teaching. Who is going to rise up and bring the system, the teachings of the instructors to the next generation of martial artists. When I consider the role that Sensei Demura has played in the lives of so many in the world of martial arts, I don't know that I would ever consider myself to be qualified to pass on his teachings. But it seems very clear to me from talking with Sensei Shironi today that he is. Thank you for coming on the show, Sensei. I am still digesting and will be for a while the things that we talked about. Listeners, I hope that you got as much out of this one as I did. If you want to head on over, check out the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check out whistlekick.com for all of our products. You can find us on social media at whistlekick. And you can sign up for the newsletter at either, really, just about any of the websites that we make. And if you haven't checked out martialartscalendar.com, why don't you do that? If you don't see some martial arts events that you know are going on, please submit them. We want that to be the most comprehensive website for martial arts goings on that you can find. And you know what you'll conveniently notice missing from it? Any sort of advertising or pay or anything. I just want everybody to have as many opportunities to participate in martial arts as possible. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.